Good morning, everybody. Just going to wait for folks to join the room. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our webinar, Localizing AI for Agriculture, Successes and Challenges. <clears throat> I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I want to orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom, you'll see most of your controls. You can use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. And to ask questions, you can use the Q&A button in the toolbar on the left. Please indicate who your question is for, and you can ask questions throughout the event. We'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and speakers will be plugging their questions in, responses into the questions throughout the event as well. Lastly, we're recording this webinar, and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. And you can also find those resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Josh Woodard. Great, right. thank you, Michael. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar on localizing AI for agriculture. Uh, this is part of AgriLinks, AgriLinks uh, theme month on AI and agriculture. Um, so really excited to, um, to have three great speakers uh, here today. Um, this actually, the impetus for this, uh, webinar itself or the, the focus is, you know, I think a lot of us have um, are already aware of uh, a lot of the advances in generative AI, um, you know, with ChatGPT, with Bard, with Claude and, and others. Um, and, you know, even myself, I was working with some colleagues in Pakistan and we were just for fun. We said, well, let's just test and see, you know, how well does um, ChatGPT uh, and Claude, um, how well do they actually respond in a generalized way, you know, using their generalized models? If we ask them specific questions about, um, you know, agriculture-related questions in the context of context of Pakistan. Um, so we asked, asked them both in English. Um, they did a pretty good job in English. Then we asked in Urdu, um, also fairly good. Um, and I think, you know, English is to be expected because there's a ton of uh, language on a uh, ton of information data online in English. Urdu is also, you know, has a fair representation online. But then we tested it in um, Punjabi, in um, in Pashto and Sindhi, and the models fell apart. I mean, they had uh, horrible comprehension. Uh, you know, in one case, we had asked. Uh, well, we always ask the question: When is the best time? to plant wheat in Faisalabad. And in one of the languages, it said the best time is between midnight and noon. <laughs> so it completely misunderstood the, the actual essence of the question. Anyway, so that, you know, um, got me thinking, well, you know, it'd be great to have a webinar to, to really dig into this deeper because I know that there are organizations that are um, already sort of going head in um, and exploring how do you really localize AI in the context of agriculture? Um, so if we can go to the next slide, I would love to briefly introduce you to our three speakers today. Um, so today we'll have uh, speaking with us. First uh, up will be Rebecca Riacatimbo from the Common Voice uh, Project at Mozilla. Uh, then we'll have Archana Karanam, who's the um, Global Product Operations Lead at Digital Green. And then Last, Elliot Jones Garcia will round us out. Uh, he is working with CGIR's Digital Innovation Initiative. Um, so we're going to have, they're each going to present, talk about some of the work that they're doing, localizing uh, both data sets and actual AI deployments um, in, uh, you know, as it's relevant to agriculture or the context of agriculture. Um, and then we're going to have time for Q&A and, and hopefully a pretty robust discussion. Um, so please, as you're as you're listening, get those questions in. Um, and with that, let's let's just jump right in. So if we can go to the the next slide, and then I'll hand it off over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Josh. Hi, everyone. 
Um, so this is a very interesting conversation, especially for me, because um, language is a very critical thing, especially uh, if you look at it as one, a barrier and also an entry. So language can be a barrier to access technology, but it can also be an entry point for people to access technology. If we have as much technology that is available in different languages, then we're building more inclusive tools and we're having more people engage and interact with technology. So that's how Common Voice came into play. Um, can you move to the next slide? So Common Voice is generally a project that is used to help make voice cognition open and accessible to everyone. It's basically teaching machines how real humans speak. So Common Voice basically just relies and is powered by the voices of people. Communities come together, communities create uh, the data set together, and they contribute to it and they get their language represented. Uh, so Common Voice was launched in 2017. Uh, and when it was launched, it was within the Mozilla Corporation, so the company side of Mozilla. And at that point, it was mostly launched in English language and it was used to train the deep speech module. And after that, there was a lot of conversation around the challenges that exist within the language space. So in 2018, uh, there was an interest to include more multilingual other languages to be engaged. So languages like German, Irish started coming in. And then there was also a lot of conversation around underrepresented languages, which some of them include African languages and indigenous languages. So during that phase, um, that's when Kenya Rwanda, a language that is spoken in Rwanda, came into place. And there was a lot of work towards building data sets that can be used in voice technology. So just to, to, to take you back on how the Common Voice platform works, is that Common Voice platform basically crowdsources voice data sets. And on that platform, you are allowed to be able to, one, contribute your voice, or validate what others have contributed. And the data set is curated into a package that you can download and be able to use now for those people who are building data set. And it's publicly available, it's an open uh, data set. And then in 2019, more new languages started coming into place. We had things like Farsi, Spanish, uh, Esperanto come into places and more features were added. So when you go on the Common Voice platform, uh, one of the things that makes it unique is that you have an ability to one, donate your voice anonymously or record or, I mean, register yourself and then be able to uh, contribute to the platform. So if you do it anonymously, we won't be able to collect the metrics. But if you register yourself, then you can be able to get the metrics. Because one of the challenges in building data set is that we're building data sets that are biased because we don't know what is in that data set. We don't know what age groups are involved. We don't know what genders are represented. And we don't know also the variants and dialects that are spoken in a specific language because you know language also carries a lot of uh, differences in it because language is not necessarily homogeneous. So sometimes you can find people who speak English, but with an accent from South Africa, with an, accent, an accent from India, with an accent from Tanzania, with an accent from Germany. So all those have to be incorporated for the voice technology to be inclusive. So newer features started coming up and then uh, now the data set was now growing, especially with having at least 18 different languages coming up to at least 1400 hours of recorded voice from over 42,000 contributors. And then when the pandemic hit, uh, we had to have a restructure and think about some of the things that were very critical to people, such as how can we be able to foster trustworthy AI by the data set that is created by Common Voice. So looking into that picture and how we can better govern the data that is collected, then that's when Common Voice became fully operational under the Mozilla Foundation. And in that process, that's when newer languages started to be introduced and with, a more, with more focus on underrepresented languages. So in 2021, with the support from uh, NVIDIA, the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development and the Bill and Melinda Guest Foundation and GIZ, newer languages started coming up. So there was work done on Kenya Rwanda, there was work done uh, on Kiswahili, the project that I'm working on, and then there was also work done on Luganda, and now more languages keep coming up. Can move to the next slide? So currently what it looks like, so uh, these data sets are from quarter one of 2023. This has changed because we have had a later version in, um, that was released, but currently there are over 27,000 hours of voice data that are collected from diverse languages, representing at least 108 languages. Those ones are those that are already launched on the platform. However, there are some languages which are in process. As I said, common voice is mostly powered by communities. So communities who speak different languages come together and they contribute to that platform. 
And the importance of it being community driven is that people can be able to contribute to a language that they feel closer aligned to, a language that they want to push or make sure that is represented as much as possible. And there are over 200 developers that have helped to create the software and there are around 450,000 unique people who are recording, validating, or doing both on the platform on any given time. Uh, can move forward to the next slide. So what exactly does this community of Common Voice comprise of? So when you go on Common Voice platform, one of the things that it allows you to do is to pick what kind of person or persona you want to represent. So in this case, you can be a voice donor. So a voice donor is someone who goes on the Common Voice platform and records their voice. So when you go on the platform, it will give you, um, so you say you want to contribute maybe to Kiswahili, then when you choose the language, it will bring you a set of five sentences. When it brings that, then you can record each of these sentences, um, read as it's written there, and then it will record that as part of the data sets that you contribute. But then when you come there as a voice validator, then you go on the platform and you listen to what others have recorded or contributed to the platform and validate. But validate doesn't mean that you look at uh, maybe they pronounce a certain word in this way because we have learned that there's variances in how people pronounce words depending on the kind of dialect that they speak or the language. So it's more looking at grammatical areas, looking at did they miss a word, did they misread a word and things like that. And then that validation helps to make sure that we have data sets that are of different levels. So we have uh, validated data sets, then we have the data set that has not been validated. And this helps people who are training the uh, model, machine learning models for voice technology to be able to have different data sets that can be able to use when they're working. Then we also have a sentence creator. So we needed a text corpus. So for the example of the language of Kiswahili, I know people know that Kiswahili is widely spoken in, in uh, several countries in Africa. It's been recognized as one of the major languages for the African Union, SADIC, the East African community, and several other countries. So one of the things about Kiswahili is that it's not a one size fits all. So Kiswahili has also its differences. So the Kiswahili spoken, let's say in Tanzania, might differ from the, the Congo, uh, Swahili spoken in Congo, and vice versa in the different places that it, uh, it's spoken. So one of the things that we had a challenge with at first is that we didn't have a lot of text corpus that we can work with. Why? Because majority of the content that is available on the internet is in English language or one of the major Western languages. So that was a huge challenge. We had to work, to find different means of ensuring that we're able to create a text corpus that can be available on the platform to allow people to contribute. So that's when sentence creators come in. So people who contribute sentences in that specific language, it can be an author who has a book and wants to split that into sentences and contribute. It can be just students who want to contribute a couple of phases or uh, written a couple of articles and then we split that down into sentences and then we upload on the platform. And then we also have a voice data set user. So this is the end user who downloads that data set from the platform and then goes on to build a voice enabled application out of it. Next slide. So one of the things that we learned in this process um, is what I call the social linguistics learning. So for example, with the Kiswahili language that I was specifically working on, there's a lot of history behind the language. So one of the things is that uh, there was involvement of colonialism, religion, and all these factors that kind of also shaped how the language evolved over time. So the history and the problems that surrounded how Kiswahili was standardized kind of led to some biases because one, uh, there's been statement of non-involvement of the local people, the Swahili people themselves, in how which language was, which type of Swahili was chosen to be the standardized Kiswahili. What are the dialects of Kiswahili have been spoken? How can we represent them? So we did a kind of an experiment. We found one of the older dialects of Kiswahili that was not widely spoken, and the small group of people that speak it along the coastal area gave us some sentences that we could upload on the platform. And we found that a lot of people who speak Swahili could not understand the sentences. So they kind of flagged them down as this is a wrong sentence, you need to take it down. But that gave us a lesson to understand that no language is specifically how it is portrayed. There's a lot of factors that change it along the way. There are a lot of dialects and variants that keep coming up of different languages. And for the data set to be inclusive, it has to be able to accommodate all these other dialects and variants that are spoken. And so that's when we thought of all these things and how to address that. So because of these challenges of communities not being involved when the language is being chosen and being standardized, 
there was the rise of something we call the linguistic insecurity and the massacre of the Kiswahili dialects. There are around 11 known dialects, but majority of people just speak the standardized Swahili. So all these are also languages that are kind of becoming underrepresented despite the fact that they, some of the original or the, the languages or dialects that were spoken actually by the communities within this space. Next slide. So how did these things all impact our work? First of all, we had to go into work with linguists and kind of identify what are the dominant dialects or variants that exist of the language. And then we had to think of how we can be able to help in the process of people building um, their machine learning models using that data set. So one of the things we had to do is we had to have a creation of evaluation and we had to create fine tuning sets for these languages that kind of will help to track how well uh, speech recognition models will perform for different groups of people that is to be to enable the developers to be able to improve on how they're building models for languages. So for example, if you test uh, a certain data set that we have or a model for a specific dialect, how does it respond? Because we know people won't always speak the same or how they pronounce words, the accent that they carry, so all those differences. So that kind of brought in the, the question of how we can better represent a language in all its in all its aspects, the different variants, the, the way people pronounce it differently. The next slide. So one of the things that we have been doing in terms of evaluation is, for example, in model evaluation, just to take a step back, um, in 2022, we launched an awards and at least eight uh, organizations were awarded with grants totaling to at least 400,000 US dollars. And they were to use this data set that we curated on the platform to build models that can fit within the structure of uh, finance and agriculture domain. So these uh, awardees, they build uh, applications that address different things. Some were looking at the maize value chain, land rights for women, looking at things like um, financial literacy, um, corporate savings societies, climate change, a lot of things in white space within those domains of finance and in agriculture. So we had to find a way to evaluate if the data set that we collected, first of all, is looking at the different demographics within the society, but also addressing the differences in the language in terms of the variants and the dialect token. So one of the things that we have been working with our RDs and also with the team local internally is to create is to have evaluation um, methods. One of them is the character error rate, word error rate to kind of find where the biases come into place. Then we also have the democratic uh, evolution, uh, evaluation. So for example, how do these models respond to women versus men? How does it respond to people who are maybe over 30, under 30 of a certain age group? How do they respond to specific dialects? Uh, the difference in the speakers who have contributed on the platform. And then, of course, looking at how they respond in terms of the, the, the domains themselves in finance, in agriculture. So language is pretty an interesting conversation, but it's really an entry and barrier when it comes to access to opportunities or access to the technology itself, because we meet a lot of communities that cannot use technology just because it's in a language that they don't understand. And that is the importance of having platforms like Common Voice that helps to build these data sets that are freely available for communities to build actually technologies that speak or understand the languages that they come from. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi, this is Archana Karnam from Digital Green. And first of all, uh, I, I would thank um, AgriLinks for this opportunity for me today be, to be here and share all our experiences and localization in AI. Um, so before I, I start, I would like to say that so localization has been part of our DNA, not just in, in, with AI, even in the past work, even with our video-based extension approach, which we've been doing over a decade from now. So let me take you through a like, quick context before I get into the, the, the AI and the localization part of it. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we all know about the first generation. So we will we'll start our discussion with this premise, and 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 it's all about like training in the visit extension model, and and in, in 
talking about the India context. Um, so we have this uh, age, extension agent to farmer ratio of one is to thousand with the staggering of uh, 200,000 extension workers responsible for serving 141 million hectares. So we all know this, right? Like, you know, we all know this challenge across, across all these developing countries. So the challenge here is evident. It's slow, costly, and exclusive approach. So with an average of like $35 per adoption per farmer per practice. So what do we need? We need a more efficient and an inclusive solution. Next slide, please. Yeah, so how can we increase the speed, effectiveness, and the inclusion of the extension systems? Next slide, please. Yeah, so here is where Digital Green steps into the picture. Way back in 2007, emerged out as a result of research in Microsoft and have come up with a, a video-based extension uh, model where producing farmer producing the friendly videos to make the public extension a whole lot better. After more than a decade of experience in the knowledge up our sleeves, we have got over thousands of 7,000 of these videos, 7,000 plus of these videos. They're not just in one language. They are in 40 different languages. Here is where I meant like localization is a part of our DNA, wherein we have not at the, not at the state level, at the district level, and even within the districts, like at, at the block level, um, the localization has been like taken care. And, and guess what? We already shared this knowledge over 5.2 million farmers across India and Ethiopia. And the best part in our approach is it, it has made a real impact in terms of cutting down the cost from $35 to 3.5 and boosted the farmer income by 24% compared to the first generation. Next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So, but didn't stop there. Exploring about how we can really make a difference, introduced a data exchange protocol, getting the registries and the science-based data sets together, resulting in more adoptions, um, more adoptions without compromising on the data privacy and, and the consent issues. So this led to the higher acceptance and the adoption over the generic recommendations. Um, but going with our core ethos, next slide, please. So uh, we always want to put uh, the underserved farmers first. And as the technology evolves, so do we. So this is leading to our like need for the generative AI for the extension agents. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In our approach, in our approach, we create a dynamic localized conversational interface in local languages accessible via generative AI chatbot for extension agents. Farmer generated videos combined with the valuable feedback drive rapid improvements in our advisory content. We streamline extension agents tasked by integrating essential data capture process into our chatbot. Our goal remains clear empower and support extension agents and farmers through automation and inclusion, tailored conversational designs. So we are shifting the, the com communication paradigm basically here. So guiding the users to the relevant videos based on their unique needs and interest. The strategic shift ensures our solutions are accessible and highly relevant to the diverse audience. Next slide, please. So now let me take you through the, uh, the quick architecture. Um, so let's take a closer look behind the scenes at our tech, tech setup. So those blue squares represent a treasure agriculture content so think of it as like a mix of smooth and chunky data it's it's like the, the, the structured and the unstructured data so our videos here are the real stars um, so uh, 7000 plus videos which have been produced across um, several languages 40 plus languages so they go beyond delivering information so they forge connections and build trust and it's not just about the videos we have got a variety of resources including the fact sheets and and many more now uh, if, if you look at the behind the scenes the data preparation is where the magic happens so it's like the the secret sauce so involving tasks like crunching numbers from the call center logs we have taken these call center logs from the departments and sorting through the all these the crop fact sheets what we have received from our uh, partners so what's essential to know is that all this content is already the part of trusted farmer friendly advisory support so it, it is it's not randomly from 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 all over from the internet of things so we are not again like starting from the scratch so we are enhancing what's already there so we're not stopping at these basics we are breaking down the barriers and ensuring the inclusivity with a particular focus on women roles and challenges and here is what the exciting part so we are tapping into the new data sources like like weather and market data it's it's like discovering all the, the hidden hidden treasures uh, that, that can revolutionize and how we can support farmers and make informed decisions. So there, so there you have it. It's 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 a sneak peek into the tech world that, that powers our mission. So it's not just about the data, it's making a real impact in the world of agriculture. Next slide, please. Yeah. So so we we are using some like 
tools like um, GPT 3.5, 4, and we're also testing out the Llama 2. So now what's happening is it's all about the RAG, the, the retrieval argumented generation, thinking, thinking of it as like giving our models a backstage pass to the specialized knowledge so they can access the external data sources, which makes them even more knowledgeable. So this process has two steps. First, we gather the information and put it in the vector database. So the database is like like handy guide with tags and codes, making it easier for our models to understand. And then we have Bashini, which is our like supercharged Google Translate. So it does the speech recognition and translation, helping our models understand and work with different languages. So in a nutshell, we are boosting our language models with more knowledge and the context to make them even like making them even smarter. Next slide, please. Yeah. Now let's dive into how we can interact with our advanced language models. So we have streamlined the process through our user interface. So you have multiple options like Telegram, WhatsApp, and, and then our own proprietary in-house app. Notably, Telegram has had a significant impact in Kenya. Additionally, we offer online and the SMS functionalities for enhanced reliability. So our chatbot is not conf just confined to the text. It possesses the ability to comprehend, perceive, and even like converse in local languages, facilitating the seamless communication. So one distinctive feature is, is, is the stateful dialogue here, meaning the chatbot retains the previous conversations, eliminating the need for the repetitive explanations. So furthermore, we place a significant emphasis on like personalized interactions, especially concerning the representation of the women's, women's voices. So we strive to customize responses, providing a tailored experiences rather than relying on the default interactions. So we value like feedback. So one can the user can provide the real-time feedback through a simple thumbs up, thumbs down, and further providing the more specific feedback for the response which he or she has been has been received. So this aids in enhancing our services further. So our, our, our chatbot excels at extracting the pertinent information from the documents in the videos, while the history of the interactions contributes to developing more dynamic profiles for the extension agents. So this deeper understanding allows us to efficiently address the user specific needs, thus, thus resulting in much more like, you know, efficient and personalized uh, kind of advisory yeah next slide please yeah, so we uh, this this is the quick sneak peek of uh, what's happening in Kenya, and and the, and the numbers are until December. So we are witnessing a notable trend where where an increasing number of users are joining and utilizing the system without formal onboarding. So we are we are uh, we have this like a set of formal onboarding being done, which is the dark blue ones, and and then the light blue uh, line shows up. This is without the formal onboarding. So this suggests a strong pull towards our platform. So when it comes to retention, we are keen on understanding the usage patterns. So notably, uh, the women frontline workers have emerged as like particularly the active users surfacing their male counterparts in, in multiple locations. Specifically, we also have seen this in, in Bihar and India. Um, so where they've been sending like two to three times more messages and engaging with the bot um, more, more um, extensively overall. Yeah, next slide, please. So Farmer Chat is, is more than just an advisory channel. So if you, if you look at I know it, it, it covers a range of uh, features like content library, profiles, performance management, FLU, FLW training, the, the extension um, agents in-app trainings, and then reports and dashboards for the decision making and, and the marketplace function where, uh, I know, the, I mean, at present, we don't have all the features. So we have we are like midway and then um, as we progress and as we see how, how the users are like kind of like, you know, showing up and based on again, the partner's uh, interest, the partners with whom we are working, we are furthering on the features, what we are offering on the chatbot. Um, so the integration is further strengthened through the institutional partnerships here, like resulting in a positive impact on various um, aspects. Um, the platform goes beyond the individual farmers. It empowers them to come together and collaborate using a natural language interface. Gender inclusion and the climate are our guiding objectives, serving as our not starts that guides our efforts. Um, next slide, please. So where are we now? Yeah. So um, in, in India, uh, introducing our Vista, the national platform in India, a collaborative initiative marked by a partnership with government of india so our ambitious plan is to span across all 28 states in five year time uh, reaching 200 000 flws and 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 impact approximately 20 million farmers uh, so we now started with our like you know focus states on rajasthan uttar pradesh and madhya pradesh so our footprint extends to cover approximately 16 different crops providing holistic agriculture support so within this network we have engaged like 1200 users um, with an 
with an impressive exchange of like you know i, I know these numbers are um, we, we we just started in india um, our, our kenya is, is a much more matured um, ai bot uh, and in in kenya we have embraced uh, like eight valuable um, agriculture value chains uh, so based on uh, the, the the priority value chains which are being like practiced over there so uh, we have like 3000 plus individuals um, who have who have been like exchanging over like 30 40000 uh, messages across so um, and uh, we have actively been exploring the small scale pilots on a global scale with initiatives underway in colombia mongolia morocco um, and 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 trying to like reach and and then impact to the diverse agricultural landscapes as well yeah now now while I'll, I'll get to the core part of it like on the uh, how do we uh, next slide please so how are we trying to make it um, more more localized so in in at digital green we have taken efforts to streamline and localize our product especially with respect to our language capabilities so the bot supports three languages in india Hindi, Telugu, and English, and two languages in Kenya, Swahili, and English, catering to more than like these languages cater to more than like eighty-five percent of the populations in this region. So we started with this, and yes, um, even in in uh, the previous presentation in in the Josh the introduction, uh, so we we heard that like you know how how uh, different languages are being like you know performing. Uh, something like English is, is always there's a good response and then performing really well. But the main challenge comes with 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 a, uh, with a less spoken and and a much more a local accent. Uh, so we, our recent experiences in, um, in, in India, um, it says like, you know, the, the, even within the Hindi, the, there's a Hindi which is like very commonly spoken, which is a national language in, um, in, in India. But uh, even within Hindi, there are different dialects. So the bot is still not able to pick up that local dialects. Uh, so after each state, um, has has a different line. So so this is where we we are like really kind of facing challenges, and we are working towards this and training the bot and and exploring the options where we can like the help the bot to understand the local dialects and make it much more like you know, uh, understand the the, uh, the user better. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay, our, our bot content is sourced from local. Uh, so, how do we like source the content? Is from the local institutions in both English and the local languages, enhancing the contextualization. So, in response to the user feedback, we added a language choice option based on the lessons learned during the initial trials. Um, so, the bot offers text, audio, and the video features in the local languages, enabling users to communicate and receive responses in their preferred language. Next slide, please. So in our journey, we, we encountered a set of challenges that we are actively addressing. So one such challenge revolves around dealing with the multiple languages. It often involves investigating whether an issue is related to the transcription, translation, uh, content, or even a software bug. So it's like solving a very complex puzzle. Collaborate, collaboration is the heart of what we do. So we constantly working closely with the experts to iterate and improve our content. Their insights are super important in ensuring that the information we provide is accurate and highly valuable to our users. So our commitment to improving extends to enhancing our AI models, particularly in languages like American Telugu, where, where we have seen the performance is not, not great um, compared to um, Hindi, um, compared to um, Swahili, and even compared to the English, of course. So we have focused on um, bolstering the speech recognition, translation, and text-to-speech capabilities to provide an even more seamless experience for our users. Despite our progress, we acknowledge that our messaging interface has its own limitations. To overcome this, we are exploring the options. We would serve as a platform for efficient profile management, structure, uh, data collection, and the content titration, further uh, elevating the user experience. Next slide, please. And one of the, like, the foremost challenges in, in ensuring the precise translations in the local languages, both for um, voice and text input. This is essential to break the language barriers effectively and ensure seamless communication. Integrating extensive data sets seamlessly would be greatly facilitated by implementation of common location lookup feature. This enhancements hold significant promise in, in enriching the overall user experience again. So variations um, between the telegram phone numbers and the registered information have surfaced as a challenge that demands the ongoing attention. So we are committed to resolving these disparities, ensuring a smooth and accurate um, user identification process. So it is important to recognize that 
not, again, not all the uh, the frontline workers with the smartphones have an internet access. So bridging this connectivity gap is essential to ensure that all the potential users can benefit from our um, platform effectively. So furthermore, our observations have revealed a slow initial interaction with the chatbot, primarily due to the newness of the concept among the frontline workers. So to overcome this challenge, we emphasize the importance of close monitoring, proactive nudges uh, to initiate the engagement and familiarize users with the platform. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, so far our story and, and is happy to take if there are any questions at the end of this um, session. And thank you. That's it from my end. And yeah, this this particular slide, I mean, you, you see the QR slide if you want to try out our bot and, and share the feedback, please do, please do. And you're always welcome to do that. Thank you. All right. My name is Elliot Jones Garcia. Thank you to AgriLinks for having me. Sorry about the delay in starting my presentation. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a project conducted by my colleague Nelson Maganga and I. And luckily Nelson will be joining later for the QA. The project has been conducted as part of the CGIR initiative for digital innovation in collaboration with Farm Radio International, or FRI. I will be sharing some reflections on our design of an automated speech recognition tool for low resource languages and Bantu languages, which we have named Longa, or Let's Talk in Swahili. Farm Radio International is an NGO which hosts talk radio programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. They work on the principle that farmers have a lot to say, that in sharing knowledge, farmers should also have a voice, and that radio is a pragmatic tool for doing so. We sought to find out if we could support them in this endeavour through the use of AI. The collaboration began in 2021. The first year was largely scoping and sensitization, in which we got to know each other and what forms of software were available. This resulted in a proof of concept for the tool that would become longer. Then the last year, which will be the topic of this presentation, has been an effort to make this concept a reality. We are happy to say we are now at a stage where we are field testing the model, and despite some ongoing technical challenges, I hope to be handing out this tool over to FRI this year. So to give some context, we were introduced a farm radio to help figure out what to do with a huge backlog of audio files they have of farmers asking questions. Their existing workflow begins with radio broadcasts, which reach 61 million farmers in 38 different countries. These radio shows are a combination of a drama which creates effective agricultural techniques and a question and answer session with a local expert. In a single project in 2022, Farm Radio received nearly 10,000 voice messages from farmers in five different languages, 30% of whom were women. To give perspective of how much data they collect, there are currently over 63, 33, 33 active projects. This is where we come in. Farm Radio do not nearly have the capacity to make sense of these, this volume of calls, let alone the diversity of languages. I think one employee estimated that they will read between 3 and 5%. Longer is that is thus intended to transcribe, translate, and better understand each call. This is a really world example here, with the farmer suggesting that the fertilizer is too expensive and it should be cheaper. The existing farm radio management tool, Uliza, will then receive an interface transcript and key findings, e.g., 75% of the farmers agree that fertilizer is too expensive. The information is passed on to the monitoring and evaluation team, 
who design radio programmes centred around farmer needs, for example, perhaps educating farmers on cheaper alternatives to fertiliser. Programmes are written in collaboration with over 1,300 radio stations, tailoring content and expert guests to listener demand at various scales. Providing they have access to radio, which remains one of the most effective and trusted methods of extension across Africa, in particular when access to smartphones remains restricted, Farmers will gain access to expert knowledge to improve their livelihoods whilst delivering sustainability. And at the same time, researchers gain access to a vast amount of qualitative data with insights into the lived experiences, challenges and needs of farmers. Now, at the end of our second year, we have iteratively devised a series of design principles to give shape to and evaluate our work. From the beginning, we wanted to make something that was collaborative. That was based on the needs, values and expertise of actors throughout the FRI value chain. This means that both parties were going to benefit from the collaboration. We were not going to hand over a shiny tool and FRI were not going to simply share their data. This involved extensive interaction with FRI and their stakeholders, building rapport and getting a good understanding of their challenges and opportunities. The image here demonstrates Nelson at a meeting this summer in Uganda with FRI and one of their local radio station partners. We wanted the tool to be centred around the challenges of these users and discovered we needed a tool capable of transcribing, translating and delivering actionable insight from Uganda, one of the major languages spoken in Uganda. We had started the project thinking we would be dealing with Swahili, a low resource language with limited data upon which to build and train a model and one that is morphologically complex, as demonstrated in this image, is constructed from different morphemes, unlike most European high resource languages, and that's a challenge for conventional language and processing approaches. Then with Luganda, this gets even more complicated, as much of the meaning is derived from intonation. As we discovered this, when several local Luganda speakers yielded very different interpretations of a single call during our visit. It was essential the tool would eventually be handed off to FRI for independent use. FRI were concerned that they would be made to lose access or become reliant on our support. To solve each of these issues, we decided we would need to use open access corpora, notably the Mozilla Common Voice data, and build on open source models, drawing from Hugging Face and this 2023 publication by Chains et al. A timely publication which has allowed us to utilize cutting edge research and will hopefully allow for right technicians to update the tool as and when they need it. The final tool would need to be sufficiently robust to be trained on real world data to satisfy a real world use case. To do so, we get, began by training on the Mozilla data for Swahili, thanks, thanks to uh, our colleague, other presenter Rebecca for this, uh, which is a relatively higher resource language. To transfer knowledge gained from this data set Onto the Maker into a data set from Makira University, which contains a selection of radio samples of Luganda speakers, which we sourced to better resemble the FRI farmer phone calls. And we decided on a conformer model inspired by Coup 2021, which is better suited to morphologically complex languages due to its ability to capture both local and global context, focusing on summaries of important information, allowing it to generalize and increase performance. We needed to find a way for longer to be expanded into new languages without requiring significant input for the end user and to deal with issues such as code switching or changing languages mid-sentence and low quality or noisy phone calls. We found that fine-tuning fine was an effective method, running labelled FRI data through pre-trained models to achieve competitive results. In the final model, we intend to employ toolkits which would make operating longer accessible to users beyond the AI community, in particular, in particular Nemo, which has pictured here, which means users without advanced programming expertise can tune the model to new data simply by adjusting a few lines of code. We wanted to utilize state-of-the-art technology, enhancing the FRI workflow whilst contributing to the broader AI, AI community. 
On the one hand, we had great success. By tweaking and fine tuning, we achieved a 10% increase in the word error rate of the conformer model on the Magio dataset. On the other, we have faced ongoing challenges in using FRI data, which unlike the Makiri dataset, is not optimized for this task. And we are now exploring tools to deal with the inconsistency of variety and length and content of pharma calls. Then moving on to our final principle, the tool is intended to expand the number of female and youth voices and voice in agricultural concerns. We have demonstrated throughout that there is a future for these tools. The focus of this next year of work will then be to scale up and ensure the impact. We want to see downstream analyses that are much easier to do, to inform the design of radio programmes and to expand FRI's capacity to add further languages to longer. To do so, we hope to address technical challenges through further pre-processing and we'll be going back to our collaborators and the community of Luganda speakers to workshop a series of analyses to interface the model output. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I look forward to the talk. Great. Thank you so much, um, Elliot, and, and before that, uh, Archon and Rebecca. Um, oh, my video is off. Sorry about that. You just hear a voice coming at you. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we are going to move into the Q&A and discussion. Um, for those who joined a little bit late, I'll just quickly reintroduce myself. I'm Josh Woodard. I'm the Senior Digital Advisor with USAID's Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security. Um, we actually have a ton of questions coming into the Q&A, so thank you all so much. Keep putting them in um, as you have questions. Um, Archana, there are a bunch that are very specific to you and Digital Green. Um, we'll sort of put those at the back end and we'll start with the more general ones. But of course, you know, please, uh, if you want us to respond to people in text um, without getting too distracted, I know it's hard to <laughs> focus yeah, on a Q&A. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, to, to start us off, I actually wanted to um, ask a, a question to each of you um, first, and then we'll, uh, we'll go to some of the audience questions. And I know that, you know, You've each touched on this uh, to a degree in in each of your talks, um, but I'm curious if anyone would like to share more, can speak more about the sort of level of effort and and challenge um, in onboarding lower resource languages relative to others. So, like in the case of Archon, if I can think about you know your work, right? There was English to to Hindi, I'm sure there was some difference in terms of that, um, you know, what that looked like. Um, then when you go from Hindi to Telugu, perhaps, you know, you have a little bit more of a gap. Then, you know, maybe we go from Telugu to something that is very, um, you know, a small number of people speaking, you know, so, um, you know, in that sense, how would you, what are the orders of magnitude in sort of making it work uh, in a in less uh, resident languages and then if I tweak that question for you Rebecca um, and Elliot I think this is also you know relevant to you as well um, but you know how do you actually source um, content and and voices in, in the case of you know common voice from languages that are not only underrepresented but where the individuals who speak that language may be less likely to have access to uh, digital technology, access to the internet to be able to contribute. So then your um, the cost of acquiring that language becomes that much harder. Um, and then, you know, also Elliot, in your case, um, you know, how are you thinking about as you start to scale this up into to more countries, you know, where you might not have some of those data sets like the one that you had from Rutgers University, you know, how, how would you, you know, how are you thinking about dealing that again in underrepresented languages? So sorry, I tried to customize that bigger question for each of you, um, but, you know, I would love your, your thoughts on that. Sure, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. so uh, so for us, um, the experience uh, so far says so like, you know, the more you go deeper into the like you know kind of languages so let's like, say even even like if we talk about hindi so hindi uh, even even within hindi like 
as, as such hindi is like a like very wide spoken language in india but again if you go at the, each state level the way it's been spoken the the words which have been used the local dialects are entirely different so that's where um, we we face lots of challenge across where um, the user asks something in in his uh, is or her own like you know hindi accent where bot was not able to um, recognize like someone asked uh, patti patti is like leaves right uh, so it has it has understood like it has another like a very similar meaning of patti's husband so it it is like from the leaves to husband uh, so that's that's the kind of <laughs> like it has created a hell lot of confusion among the users in terms of the the way uh, the words are being used the way the the bot is understanding the local dialect so what i mean to say here is there is always the more you get deeper into the deeper in terms of like in you know, language localization in the accents so we don't have any kind of like models existing models which can support that level of localization so what are we trying to do so so in that context, Context, our experience is that so we need to like kind of there's a room to like train the bot there's a room to build much more like you know stronger uh, language models in that context so we are working with someone like like karya to help these models like in in bhojpuri which is like again like, like a very similar to hindi but again um, a local uh, dialect kind of a form of a uh, uh, hindi um, so i think uh, there was also a question on the chat on how are we, how are you trying to like you know work with the, with the languages which are not widely spoken so something like we don't have any models yet. and and if you look at like even in india even like um, even in kenya context so we we just have like swahili and then and then even the kuiku uh, the sorry if i'm pronouncing it wrong the this is an, an, the second language which we we don't have like you know good language models around that so that's that's where like we are coming up with this like you know with the help of this agencies like karya so we we are building up trying to build these language models around these um, more like underserved languages yeah so if probably like you know maybe in the next webinar we'll be able to like share a much more progress on how are we progressing on that and and how does that really made a difference uh, from before yeah but we could see the difference like initially even like hindi was like a little tough but now hindi is doing good swahili is doing good uh, telugu is also doing good uh, but like as i said again like getting more deeper into the localization part still we are we do have those challenges and we are working on those language models to um, overcome that great thanks arshana um rebecca do you want to go to the next or oh, wait uh, oh, sorry rebecca you go i saw <laughs> the mics came on off. we'll go with rebecca and then elliot <laughs> So I think for underrepresented languages, you have to be deliberate efforts to actually push for them to get represented. So one of the things that we're doing at Common Voice is looking into getting more investment, more funding into having languages that are underrepresented to be part of the platform. And in some cases, why we need that funding is because we have to have deliberate efforts to engage those communities. So for example, there are some dialects of certain languages that are spoken with people that are mostly based in rural areas, and they have no access to digital devices to contribute to our platform and our platform needs you to be connected to the internet. So we have to see how best we can support such communities. So we're looking to build, uh, we're kind of working to build other solutions that can work offline. We're also currently working to see how we can create better incentives for communities that are based maybe in rural areas or coming from languages that are not widely represented. So you have to make deliberate efforts when it comes to such languages because reaching such communities can be a challenge, but we have had some interesting progress with some of the indigenous languages, where you find that a community of people who belong to a certain indigenous community that are probably not even based currently in the community that they come from, kind of mobilize their own community and they build up something and we provide them the technical support to push for it to happen. So one of the key things is to actually have deliberate efforts to invest in that space of getting more people to contribute to the data set and then reaching out to the community and most importantly, identifying those nuances that actually limit people from uh, having their languages represented. So that can be barriers in terms of technology access, can be barriers in terms of internet connectivity. So how do you bridge those gap and reach to those people? So there's always a big push with the localization space and the language space to have more investment put in, especially for such kind of languages that are underrepresented, because it's much easier for English speakers who are a large group they're all over, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of sentences, but for underrepresented languages, you have to create a text corpus because it's not really available. Then you have to then create the voice corpus as well. So there's a lot that is involved in the process and this, you have to come up with different mechanism of how you can engage that community, how you can support it, and what kind of investment can come in to ensure that you can actively engage them to come on board. 
Great, thanks, Rebecca. And just to, for a quick plug for you, so we have people from all over the world on this uh, this session here. If somebody, you know, through their their work, their organizations, you know, their uh, engagement with local communities, if they wanted to be a contributor to to Common Voice, um, is there perhaps a, a link that you could put in the chat to uh, direct them to if people are interested in contributing um, to that corpus? Yes, yes, I'll put up the link on the chat, but I also add you, if you go on the platform and your language is not there, you can request for your language to be there, and then uh, we can support you to get a community organized to be able to push for your language to be represented on the Common Voice platform. So I'll put the chat, um, the link on the chat. Great, thanks so much. And Elliot, over to you. Oh yeah, great question, thanks. Um, I will pass this on to my colleague Nelson, who has a much more experience of the kind of local on the ground transition from our work with Swahili to Uganda. But I thought I might just add quickly that what's quite interesting with how we're working with Farm Radio International, um, and they're a very good partner. And what's in, we have kind of a different problem in that we have quite a large amount of audio data, but not so much of a text corpus. And so we're kind of coming at it from a different angle. But yeah, Nelson, if you want to expand on that, I would really appreciate it. Cheers. Yeah, um, I think also, hi everyone, my name is Nelson. I've been working with Elliot on our project for the past couple of months. And um, I will say from the get-go, we had to address this issue because um, one thing that um, I came up while starting on this project was that we had to switch from a more, a relatively more, um, a relatively higher resource language, which was Swahili, to a more, low resource language, which was the Uganda, um, and a more and more politically complex language for that matter. And so from the start, we had this at the back of our minds and we were looking at it from different perspectives um, where we wanted to see, we were aware that um, there is a scarcity of data. And so one way to overcome this we is to um, sort of deals with the deal with the rules of the languages and um, sort of and the beauty of the advancement in AI currently is you have things like transfer learning that make it relatively easier to um, deal with these more complex issues and this is the thing this is uh, the innovation that sort of allowed this tool to be a bit more um, uh, practical or um, uh, make it work in that sense where we sort of transferred we transferred knowledge from existing models that were trained on um, three languages um, or three sets of language data sets. Um, we transferred knowledge from Swahili, from a model on Swahili, a model on Kenya Rwanda, and a, a model that was a multilingual model trained on all three data sets. And the results showed that um, transfer learning worked just as good, if not better than um, training from scratch. And so this makes it easier to scale the tool or to move onto a new context, onto relatively even lower resource languages, provided that they're of the same morphology or the same structure, or they share underlying principles, rules um, on how to speak, how to write them. And so that is the beauty of the current innovations or the current um, stage of AI, where um, you can play around with more than the data and get um, or have achieve competitive results as we illustrated in our project. And so uh, it is always good to have um, data, um, but in the case, in cases where in contexts such as Africa, where there's a whole host of languages that are not digitally represented, um, it, it was it was it was important that we figure out a way to deal with the uh, the issue. And the other benefit of this is, as Elliot pointed out, is that FRI has a um, treasure trove of data or of audio data. And so, working with groups like these will definitely, as long as we have proven that these tools work and they can be applied in different contexts, it will allow once and. Well, I think one of the principles that Elliot shared is that we were we worked exclusively with, with open source resource with open source resources, um, and so at the end of this, it, we the intention is to have everyone 
be able to access these these tools and apply them in their context. And this will open up um, different opportunities where people from different places will train models in their context with the data that they have. And at the end of the day, it will contribute to the whole um, ecosystem, I think I want to say. But yeah, uh, it is a challenge and it is something that we've had to face or address from the start. Not sure if I covered it, Elliot, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for that, Nelson. Um, so another question that we've had a few people ask sort of variations of this is related to trust. Um, and I think we can and look at it from the from each of your vantage points, but you know, essentially, you know, how can you speak to or how you're building trust and confidence in um whether it's the the service so that the chatbot itself um or the the tool that you have for um for fri and their partner radio stations um or you know rebecca for entities that might want to use your data sets um you know are you encountering any um concerns that people have uh, expressed in terms of trust in in the models and the accuracy um, of what you're doing um, and how are you dealing with that how are you addressing that I mean, what what guardrails do you have in place uh, to deal with um, you know potential erroneous um, content or, or information? And maybe we can. Uh, well, Archana, you're already off uh, mute, so let's just start with you again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so th there was like while well, we have gone to a field in in, in India and one of the like you know Bihar um, district. So there, there was a question from, from one of the user while we are doing these onboard sessions. So how is this different from the Google search engine, the YouTube, the, where they usually, they are already doing that whenever they have any query related to their farming, anything, they just like get onto the Google search and then and then give a voice um, a query asking like, what do I do? This is a problem, right? So then, uh, so that was like a very super interesting question. And then that's where we, we said them like, you know, while you, you while you ask it Google, while you do the Google search, while you do the search on YouTube, it gets gets thanks all around. But the the uh, uh, and how how the uh, the farmer chat our AI assistant is different from that is like you get the content from the more verified sources, not from all over the things uh, from the Internet of Things. So who who is verifying this content? The partner with whom we are working, the government partner, the NGO partner, or the SRLMs, whoever with whom we are working and with whom these FLWs and the lead farmers are associated. So they verify this content. Only then that would be like fed as a knowledge base, and then and the, the and the and the and the bot pulls out the answers from these verified. So that's that's one most important factor which would like which was which was a like selling point for us. And they were like, oh, that that's interesting. That's good. So then we can rely. So the moment we get that we get the response, then we can take an action on that, right? So that was that was the response from them. This yes, because this is a verified content from your own implementing partner. So so that's how uh, we are trying to and and in addition uh, the content what you see like you know especially the videos what we've been using um, as a part of the responses what they get in addition to the text and the audio these videos are again from the community the one which we have been produced like more than over a decade which have been like produced by the community again where the farmer the fellow farmer has been featured so that as as we all know the concept of like you know the horizontal learning all that uh, concept of trust farmer to farmer so that is another um, kind of like you know um, the, the the feature what i could say which helps in building all that trust for the users yes i can rely on this content Great, thanks, Arjuna. Um, Rebecca, any uh, perspectives you can offer in terms of you know experience you might have had with uh, organizations that may be interested in in using some of the data sets that you've developed? Um, but you know, any questions that they might have in terms of trust in the the quality of the the data sets since they are um, you know to a degree crowdsourced, um, or do you, how do you preemptively address that? Thank you, Josh. So I think the trust issue for us, it comes in twofold. So there's the community that is contributing to the platform that also we have to build their trust. And then there's the people who use the data set. So for the community, we had to look at all these other factors that we need to make clear to them. One, that we're operating on CC0. 
what are your privacy rights that you have. Uh, you are able to contribute anonymously, but you're also able to register and give us information about yourself. And this is what we're gonna do with your information. So we really keep consent key when we're talking with communities. But something that we've also found works when it comes to trust, especially with communities, is making sure that we get them to a point where they understand what they're contributing to, what it's for, what rights do they have, what can they opt out of, what can they accept to. But then when it comes to entities and people who download and use the data set, that's why we have a huge challenge because lately there's been an author of people who say, what do we do about big tech downloading the data set and then using them for profit products while this is an open data set that people contributed freely? So that's the question that we're kind of grappling with right now. How do we build that sense of ownership to the communities that contributed effectively to this project? But at the same time, there's big tech that's coming in and making use of this data for free and then making people pay for the services that they produce out of it. So there is that huge question that we're still trying to address because it's 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 twofold. We want to push for open source, but we at the same time can't control who downloads that data set and uses it. So it's still a huge question that we're trying to grapple with. But when it comes to entities asking about the quality of the data set, we try to provide the data set with all the metrics that is necessary. So you're able to know what gender is represented, what age groups are represented, if there are dialects information, what dialects is represented, um, how much of that data set has been validated. That is for the purpose of quality, because we have uh, the data set is divided in a way that you can be able to tell which data sets are validated, which ones are not validated, which has been tested, and then which represents certain group. So maybe it's women or men or a certain age group. So we give that diversity to just ensure the quality in terms of data set that is provided. And the platform itself, the way it's modeled or built out, it pushes for people to provide quality controls, give guidelines. How should your voice be? How should you read the sentences? And then has at least two, uh, a minimum of two people validating the clips that before they go into the data set. And the release is every three months that allows time for any quality checks to be done on the back end before it comes out for people to be able to download. Thanks so much, Rebecca. That was uh, really interesting. And definitely, I can see the challenge uh, of, you know, building that contributor trust, especially when, you know, it may be then used for for uh, private purposes. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I will use it just as a quick opportunity, although not entirely on that topic, but very similar, just to plug, there was a report that USAID and uh, the Gates Foundation funded uh, earlier last year on farmer-centric data governance. Um, so just gonna put that in the chat in case it might be of interest and then turn it uh, to Elliot and Nelson to field that question. Yeah, I think in term, trust in terms of fidelity to the the original message of the farmers making phone calls in our, in our data set and how that's translated and transcribed. Um, I think it's just the case of us doing our very best to make sure the models are accurate. Um, I think I'll pass that to Nelson shortly if he has anything else to add on that respect. Um, I think another aspect of trust has been very much the building of a relationship between ourselves and the and our partners, Farm Radio International. Um, and I hope they would agree that we've, uh, quite a good rapport has been built. Um, but I think most interestingly for me is, that has come out of this project, is around the idea that we're aggregating the um, the qualitative experiences of farmers and their problems. Um, I feel it's something quite new and quite a lot to learn there. Um, and I would suggest that that's something that I think we need to deal with as we move through the next phase of our work in terms of how, um, when, how, how that actual trust translates into the final aggregation and le learnings that we can gain from these, these voices together and whether or not we can actually still um, speak to the, both their individual and collective concerns. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Nelson. Mm, I am definitely more of the tech guy and I will speak on uh, trust, the, that uh, trust, trust for the tool, I guess, is more, we definitely tried to make it, we even, we, we were definitely skeptical ourselves and, and whether or not we can trust this tool because it's definitely, a whole new area um, and a whole difficult area to work with. And part of what we, part of the measure we employed to make it um, reliable at least is 
A, we tested it on several models because most of the tool is based on fine tuning of um, already pre-trained models. And just to make sure that we're not um, uh, uh, fooling ourselves even, or we were not basing it on um, quick results, we tested it on several models that, as I mentioned, models trained on several languages, models trained from different sources. And also we fine tuned the models on different data sets, one of which was the Mozilla data set on Luganda, as well as the Makara data set um, that was recently re released, I believe it was last year. And so these me all these measures and the results that we obtained from these measures sort of give us a certain confidence um, in saying that um, this is the level of performance that the, the tool has. And if it's once it's released and people can try it out, they will be able to um, see all that went into building the, the tools. And since the tool itself is open source, to be able to um, sort of see or try it out for yourself and maybe even build it out for yourself. And for things like the model weights, they'll, they'll probably be uploaded on a platform such as Hugging Face and um, things of the sort. So that is, those are some, some of the measures that we try to employ, employ to sort of um, make the tool a bit more reliable or, um, or ready for deployment into the field, but yeah. Great, thank you for that, uh, Nelson. So on that, that last point in terms of it being open source, um, I know Rebecca has already shared the link for people who want to contribute um, to Common Voice. Uh, would you be able to share any links uh, and Archana, same for you if you want to put in the former chat link here um, for people who want to just play play around experiment uh, learn I, I saw we had a ton of questions and chats of people saying you know can you do it in this language can you do it in that language you know I know that there's um, probably some resource constraints that <laughs> you know not you all wouldn't be able to to serve everyone who is uh who is sharing different languages that they're interested in, but perhaps that there's opportunities for them to um, to go their own and build on what is already what has already been built, um, which I'll use to then segue into a question that was asked, um, which is you know this was by Satish, um, and he said with many organizations and players coming with similar tools and solutions, how can we avoid information overload? Uh, to farmers. Um, and so, you know, I would welcome your thoughts. I mean, this is nothing new per se. There's always been a lot of different um, solutions um, that are sort of vying for the attention of farmers, whether it be just as, you know, them from an individual consumer lens or from their sort of, you know, professional um, farmer lens. Um, but I imagine, you know, to the teacher's point, it may be increasingly more so as it becomes a lot easier for people to deploy their own um, bots with you know tools that are, are openly available. Um, not that it's easier to do it well, but it's easy to get it out, whether or not it's accurate. So curious if you know if any of you have thoughts on that. You know, how are you dealing with that? This sort of uh, increase in uh, potential. Um, deployment of tools that are trying to to serve the audiences that that you're working with, um, and that's just open to anyone. Whoever comes off uh, mute first, take it. Go for it, Elliot. You got it. <laughs> I was I was just going to say just off off top of the open source thing. I think it's interesting that. Um, some of these tools are very easy to access, and so they're easy to do. They're easy to do badly, but very difficult to do well. Um, I think that was a, it's quite a simple way of putting it. But it also made me think because it's a bit of a cop out for this because it's basically very lucky for us with working with farm radios that they are the ones who are communicating the information to the farmers. But they have what's very interesting about their model is that they take advantage of something that is already very well trusted. And is I suppose because it's a weekly radio show, it's not going to overload farmers with information. But at the same time as having this very, very trusted um, and bounded way of sharing information, they um they package it within something that is entertaining. And so 
it can communicate these values and things that may be more important for sustainability much more easily than it would do for um, simple statistics, which might then lead to confusion. Yeah. Thanks, Elliot. Um, Archana, how are you all doing with that? I mean, it, Digital Green has been around for a while. Um, I know within India and Kenya, both of them have robust digital ecosystems. I imagine that there are a lot of um, people who, if they haven't already deployed them, they're tinkering with and planning to deploy ag-related chatbots in, in both of those countries as well. Um, and you know, all, all it can take sometimes is somebody uses one chatbot and it leads them astray and it, you know, ruins their, their harvest. Um, and so now they've, they've lost trust. And, and then that goes back to the trust question. So anyway, just curious, you know, how do you, how do you all deal with that? Yeah, with this, uh, you know, the, the digital revolution is like in India, we all know that it's like every, you take any FLW mobile phone and, and you find a minimum of 10 such things. So they, they, they come back and say, no, we can't have another one. So, so hence, uh, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, there's no way that people are like, you know, wanting for such digital solution. There's so many already, but what they're really looking for is like, you know, something which the, the, where the content is like more authentic and something which they can already like, you know, use in their existing application. That's where, where we switched to, um, uh, we, we started with WhatsApp and Telegram so that they would, they would be already there. Um, you know, that application would be there on, on their mobile phones and they can just, you know, kind of like discover the uh, link and then and then start using it. Um, but and you you are right. Like you know, the shelf life of these apps are like just a season or the project period, and after that, like you don't find it again. Um, so in fact, uh, I I should I should say that the our hero we always say here is like the content and the FLWs, the one who who are using it. No, not not really the 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 app or or the bot. What what we are talking about. Um, but um, yes, they, I mean, for us, that was that was kind of like never a challenge of like, you know, how do we kind of really come up with like X number of bots for different partners. So that was like the only the, the initial investment in terms of like building all that tech architecture. But like, as you move on, it's, it's just like replicating, having just multiple channels based on what partners prefers. But again, always for us, the challenge has been is like, the content what goes into it and on what user expects um uh, fr uh, from that so so that's that's been our like experience in this josh yeah okay thanks Ashina. and rebecca maybe i can sort of flip that question i know it for you in some of the instances where you are um helping to develop you know data sets in languages that are really underrepresented where I would say perhaps there's not an information overload, it's perhaps an information underload in terms of the ability for them to access content in local languages. Um, you know, do you have any stories or examples of you know, how as people are using your data sets and being able to uh, make services available in languages that, are, um, that don't have sufficient uh, sort of digital um, information, um, you know, how are they reacting to that? Have you have you gotten to that point yet, where you're starting to see reactions from uh, from communities that are then receiving the results of their contributions in in terms of services or information coming their way? Yeah, so we did have um, contributions from uh, Congolese Swahili. So Swahili is widely spoken, but then the so he is that spoken in Congo has much limited information that's available. So one of the cases that we got out of it, a case study out of it was a land rights application was developed that speaks to women land rights in the DRC. And one of the interesting findings we found was that women were very uh, surprised and very happy to see that they could actually learn the laws in the Congolese Swahili and be able to interact with the platform and say, um, how do I get a land document or how do I access um, services to have someone come and check on my land and give me a lease? So that kind of access to information that was kind of breached before because there was no that level of access to certain languages became 
much more easier. But then they were now seeing an influx of people coming up with their local languages and, and starting up a community on the platform. So we have people trying to put uh, the Meru language on the platform, put the Kisi language. So these are much smaller languages that are spoken by smaller groups of people. And more people are now coming up and say, you know what, I wish people could have a service that speaks uh, maybe an agricultural extension service that speaks in my local language because most of the farmers actually come from the rural areas and not everyone in those rural areas maybe speaks the major language if it's English or Swahili, but they speak their mother tongue languages. So there's that rise now that's coming up of people trying to bring their local languages on the platform. And this has significantly lower number of contributors, but very active communities of people that are very passionate about the language that they speak. And I also spoke of indigenous languages that are coming up, especially in North America. And you find it's a very small group of people that are just coming together and realizing, you know what, we have applications coming up every day in English. We have them coming up in different languages, but now we want to see how that works for people who speak my specific language. So I think that the case studies that are coming out of some of the languages are kind of building the case for other local languages or languages that have less and fewer resources to have people who want to come up and champion that work and see it come forward. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so we, um, so I'm just reading through this whole question. All right, um, so there's a, a question here. Um, it's a bit long, so let me, let me read it uh, out to you as is. Um, but it's from Dick Tinsley. He says, given the operational limits, most smallholder farmers have an extending small plot research slash extension results across their farms, rendering most of the extension education effort of limited value. Would the overall smallholder improvement effort be more effective badgering farmers with information they cannot use or facilitating access to information, I'm oh, sorry, to improved operational resources such as contract mechanization to enhance their ability to take advantage of the technology. So that's a, I'll only try to condense that into essentially, you know, what he's saying is, uh, should we be focusing on, uh, on the information piece uh, or should we be focusing more on the, the access to, to services, to to mechanization, to other um, resources, and you know, would uh, Arshan, I see you're you're ready. You're yeah. <laughs> you this question, so go for it. If you're just giving them the advisory piece, they'll never be happy. So because the shelf life of the content is again like tiny, like right. So they for a period of like for a season, they will be like some ten questions around the POP, twenty questions around. But but what is most important for them is the services linking up with the credit, linking up with the markets, um, and, and all about the schemes and subsidies. So this is what by and large, like across our like, you know, onboarding process, interaction with the users. So we are, we are getting this huge demand for advisory plus plus. You, you start with POP, but this, this, this again, like, you know, to sustain it, to keep up all that interest, you need to get all the other, other elements into it. Like all these services are super important. Yes. Great, thanks. Um, Oh wait, Rebecca, do you, either of you have any perspectives on that? I know that's not necessarily directly linked to, to what you're focusing on, but. I guess I agree with the question. I think it's an interesting point. Um, uh, but in terms of the information output of, of how the model is used, I think I wouldn't want to speak for Farm Radio International necessarily in terms of how they want to use it. But what we've learned is that they're focusing on increasing the way that women and youth farmers can voice their concerns. Um, and I think that their approach tends to be not so much about um, just on distributing information, but about creating these kind of values that, by which um, gender equality can be achieved by in farming households. Um, and so I think there's quite a big difference there. Great, thanks for that. Um, so I know we're we're coming up on time. We have only seven minutes left. Uh, I'm sorry, there's so many good questions. We're not going to get a chance to get through all of them. But I, I want to ask one sort of more open-ended final question to to each of you, um, and and then we'll see if we have any time for anything else. But I think that'll probably take us to the end. Um, which is, you know, as given there's you know we've seen a, a lot of interest in in this topic. 
Um, you know, we had a a lot of attendees from all over the world, lots of engagement in the in the chat and the Q and A. Just wondering if each of you might want to share, you know, your any recommendations you have. So for anyone who wants to take the next step, they're they're interested, they want to understand, um, sort of go deeper into understanding how AI might be relevant in um, in their work, um, how they might be able to, you know, crack that uh, localization nut a bit more in some of the, the underrepresented language that they might be working with. Um, you know, do you have any resources or their recommendations of, you know, where to go, who to, who to learn from, you know, how should people get started if they leave this webinar? Where should they go next to, to learn more and dig deeper? Um, and maybe we can just start in the, the direction of the presentation. So we'll go Rebecca, Archana, and then Elliot and Nelson. Thank you, Josh. So I think one, they can go and contribute data sets. So for example, the Common Voice platform, that I share the link, but there's also a wide range of data sets that are freely available that people can build from, especially for their languages. I know that Lacuna Funding has done a lot of work on building data sets for different domains, including languages. So that those are other go-to resources that you can go to to be able to access data to see what people have done with the data and what kind of use cases that can be developed out of the existing data. But there are also communities of practice that are working to use these data sets that are available and build something or that they're creating. For example, I know for the NLP movement, the natural language processing movement is the Masakane community that is doing a lot of work on African languages. Uh, we have the deep learning uh, in Daba that also is providing a lot of training and um, access to people to be able to share the work they're doing and what learning resources or tools that can they can use to upscale their work. They have Data Science Africa. So I think there's a wide range of communities that people can tap into, not only to learn um, or to improve their work, but also to access what use cases are available, what are people building, how can you contribute, and also how can you grow your language or your community and have access to all this widespread of resources that are available. Great, thanks so much, Rebecca. Arshan, what about you? Yeah. So uh, um, all our um, our all our resources are like um, you know the open source, the digitally like um, the public um, digital public goods are what I want to say. So so you can feel free to use those, and then if you are in this um, uh, like you know um, space of like you know implementing this in your particular um, respective geography, um, so we are very happy to see how best we can like you know kind of customize that um, for as per your like you know based on your like knowledge base, and, and we we are happy to do that. And the second thing, if you if you are like you know in a, the content space, the researchers, academicians. So it would be really, um, you know, exciting, and 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 we look forward for such collaborations because we see that's that's still the area where we need lots of like you know kind of kind of collaboration and, and get in this all this research content, um, and 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 involve all the academicians and and get this content onto the bot knowledge base. So we are happy to collaborate on that. So feel free to reach out to us on the uh, on those lines. And and then if, if you are in the space of like, you know, developing some language models, as I said, and, and as we've been talking about through the entire webinar, there is this huge scope wherein we need to work on these like languages where the, the, still there's no models existing. So we are really happy to collaborate and, and do all those uh, trainings on, and collaborate with you on, on ground and, 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 and train the models. So happy to do that. So. And 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 for someone who would like to know, understand our model better and how do we kind of collaborate and in, in, in the existing locations and again if there is an opportunity in a new location, so we are happy to um, explore and and um, work together. So please feel free to reach out on that. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Archana. Um, and Elliot and Nelson. Yeah, I think not much to add really, but I think one of the most wonderful things about working in this space was is the the amount of um, contributors there are out there, particularly you, the Common Voice um, data sets was one of our starting points, but also Hugging Face has been really useful, which is a great place to find all the different possibilities. But then also, I think that, that would be a great, there's always a great place to start if you see what's there and what's really available. And I'll ask Nelson if he has anything to add, because I think the next stage then is to speak to somebody who really knows what they're talking about, like Nelson, and then, and, uh, and try and make, I mean, it, make it real. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with everyone who's gone before me. Um, definitely communities are very strong. 
um, foundation are a, a great place to start. Um, and as Rebecca has mentioned, there are several communities that exist just within the NLP space, but there are definitely a lot more. And I didn't get a chance to introduce myself at the beginning of the presentation. I work as a data scientist at Zindi, and we are the largest um, data science data scientist community in Africa. And a place like Zindi is somewhere that is great to start to learn. We have a ton of resources, um, but the, the, this is just one of the platforms where you can join, you can engage with different data scientists or different people working on similar projects. I definitely know um, our company has worked with digital, both Digital Green and Mozilla before on different um, competitions as well as different projects. And so once you engage in, in communities like these, or if, if you want to go further, there are communities like Kaggle with a whole lot more resources and competitions that are both rewarding, educating, and also just um, engaging. And so it's a it's definitely how I got into the field. I started off competing and found myself engaged in data science. But yeah, it's it's definitely it's great. Um, the, the best way is to get your hands dirty and just um, engage with different communities and different um, uh, platforms through competitions and just online learning. There, are, There's definitely a vast um, amount of resources out there on the internet. And a lot of it is definitely free um, and available. Um, but yeah, I think that's great. me. Well, thank you so much. We are just about out of time. I will make uh, one or actually two last plugs. Michael um, put in the chat the link to the compendium of blog posts that were written as part of the AI and Ag theme month. So check those out. Um, also, for those who um, are looking for another channel to engage, um, the ICT for Ag conference uh, is the next one will be coming up June to be confirmed the actual dates. Um, if you're not on that list, I just put the in the chat, you can sign up to the listserv there. So you're notified when uh, conference dates are announced, uh, opportunities to to promote, uh, to apply for sessions, submit sessions. Um, and with that, uh, you know, I wanna thank everyone who has joined us today. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, I thought it was a great session. I really learned a lot. I appreciate everyone's engagement. Um, Michael, did you have a, any sort of final wrap up you wanna uh, do in terms of talking about anything coming up for AgriLinks? <clears throat> Mostly just to, like you said, check out the AI theme month collection and then do please take a look. We're running a water theme month. So if you have content that you'd like to submit or if you're curious about water and agriculture, please do check out AgriLinks and we'll be doing another webinar. It's looking like it's gonna be on the 31st for water and ag. So again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye bye.